Hello, and welcome to this webinar, Trademark Basics. This is the first of our NYSBDC Business Learning Lab winter webinars on intellectual property with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I'm your moderator, Jenny Alton, from the New York Small Business Development Center Central Office. Today, we are delighted to have with us Marisa Terrell, Attorney Advisor in the Trademarks Customer Outreach Office at the USPTO. We also have with us our NYSBDC technology expert, Liam McMahon, who is a certified business advisor at our Binghamton Center. And he'll take just a minute uh, to talk to you about some of the things that we do for technology clients here at the NYSBDC. This webinar is brought to you by the NYSBDC, New York Small Business Development Center, we are a network of 20 campus-based centers and many more outreach offices, which are located across New York State, along with the central office based in Albany. The NYSBDC is a U.S. Small Business Administration resource partner. Our free advising, education, research, and advocacy services are made possible by funding from the SBA, New York State, and our host campuses. We are so pleased to be partnering with the USPTO today as well. So you know, this session is being recorded. We will share it with attendees in the next few days, along with a PDF copy of the slides in a follow-up email. Attendees are muted and will not be on camera today. Your chats will only be visible to me and our presenters. If you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to type them in the Q&A box as they come up. You can open Zoom's Q&A box from the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will do a question and answer session at the end of Marisa's presentation. So enter those questions as we go and we'll uh, go through answering them at the end. For very specific questions that may take more time and detail to answer, or if we run out of time to answer all questions today, you can get in touch with the USPTO through the contact information that will be shared in today's presentation. You can also reply to that follow-up email that you will receive from us at the NYSBDC to get further assistance. And with that, I will turn the time over to Liam for just a moment before Marisa begins her presentation. Hi, my name is Liam McMahon. I'm the technology advisor here at the Binghamton SBDC. Um, we provide a number of services to technology focused clients, including your traditional business planning and financial planning for your business. In addition, we can provide introductions to a number of government agencies, as well as providing information through our research network to help you identify potential investors and answer other industry questions. Um, in addition to that, we also have a strong connection with the SUNY system and are able to help you leverage their resources as well to develop your product and get it to market. Uh, with that, I guess I'll let you take over, Marisa. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Liam and Jenny. It's a treat to be here with you today to talk to you about what I love, which is trademarks. Um, so we're going to get in to this conversation. Now, I'm an attorney working in the Trademarks Customer Outreach Office at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I'm thrilled to be here. And today we're going to talk about trademarks, what they are, why they are so important, and how the federal registration of your trademark can help you build your business. So let's get started because we have a ton of information to kind of get through today. So you can access these slides um, Hopefully, I think Jenny's going to be sharing them with you. So today, what are we going to be talking about? What is a trademark and how does it differ from other intellectual property? Uh, what are the benefits of registering your trademark with us, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office? How to select a strong trademark that's going to sell right on through our review process? What is that review process and where can you go for some free assistance? So hang in here as we zip through. Before we get started, though, there's one ground rule. Although I am a lawyer, unfortunately, I'm not your lawyer. So that means I cannot provide legal advice on uh, during this discussion. But there's so many other things that we can chat about. So let's get into exactly what uh, is a trademark. Uh, trademarks really are a type of property. So they're not real property. Um, so we're not talking about land. We're not talking about personal property or your car. We're talking about intangible property 
that can be bought and sold. Now, I like to think of trademarks as really one of the easiest ways to distinguish goods and services in a saturated market. I mean, think about it. If you're a business owner, you undoubtedly sell goods or you render services in the marketplace. Now, take a minute and think about those goods that you offer and those services that you render. All right. You're thinking about that, right? Now I want you to think about your competitors. Now there are lots of other owners selling similar goods and similar services. So what's a customer to do? How are they supposed to distinguish your goods and services from another? Well, I'll tell you a shortcut. One way is the brand. If you look at these brands on this slide here, you're gonna see a number of traditional marks. These are brand names, logos, designs. Now all of them though, interestingly enough, identify specific goods and services, right? They're always trademarks are always tied to specific goods and services. So when you look at these marks, what type of goods and services do you think about? Let's go through a few, a few of them. Um, I'm certain that you recognize all of them here. We've got this giant M and that is not representing me. Uh, Marie said, nope, this is McDonald's. You see this M and all of a sudden you're thinking of a specific type of hamburger, a specific type of French fry, right? Very different from Five Guys, very different from Burger King. You're thinking specifically of specific products, specific services. You see Coca-Cola. You're not thinking about some of their competitors, Pepsi, for example. You're thinking of a specific beverage and how it tastes and maybe their customer service, et cetera. You see that bitten apple there. Uh, you see that you're thinking of computer goods. Um, you might be thinking of a cool looking store uh, that sells those same computer goods and services. Those would be retail store services. You might be thinking about that. You see this Ford uh, scripted wording in this oval and you're thinking of a specific car or truck. Uh, what about this stylized check mark here? That's that Nike symbol. You're thinking of a specific type of leisure apparel or athletic uh, sneaker, et cetera. So I'm not going to run through all of these because I know that you can recognize them here. But I think what I'm trying to um, really uh, have you focus on is that trademarks aren't really uh, just you know, terms that just pop up, they're always associated with goods and services, and they're always goods and services that are offered in the marketplace. So what does a trademark do? We've talked about a little bit a bit about that already. They indicate source. They are how a customer recognizes your goods or services in the marketplace. And also, they provide a legal protection for your brand. I mean, what I mean by that is, uh, when you have a trademark, you can enforce your rights in a brand against your competitor. These are like the rights you stand upon to maybe bring an action. That would be those legal rights. But understand that a trademark is very different from a patented invention or a copyrighted creative work. Let me see if I can give you maybe an example. If you think about, let's say, for instance, um, you have a vacuum cleaner. Let's say you invented this fantastic vacuum cleaner uh, that not only can have has powerful suction, but also it's very, very quiet and it emanates a fresh, clean scent as you're moving about your house, okay? If that's your product, think about this. You might patent that invention, right? You wanna protect that invention from all others. You might trademark the brand name that you use to identify that vacuum cleaner. Maybe you wanna trademark the name Whisper Clean. Maybe that's your that's your, gonna be your mark, okay? Then you'll get a trademark on that. You might get a copyright on maybe the user manual. If maybe that user manual tells you the history of the product, how you came up with the idea, uh, maybe some, um, information on the best way to use it. You could copyright that little booklet. Uh, you could copyright perhaps the commercial that you use to promote that vacuum cleaner, or maybe even the little jingle or the song that you create to advertise it. So you can see a bundle of intellectual property rights used for the same product. And let me not forget trade secret. You might actually have a specific secret that you that sort of gives you a competitive advantage, something that you don't share with anyone else, like the secret recipe to Coca-Cola, right? Well, maybe you have a secret uh, ingredient or way that you create that scent for your vacuum cleaner. Well, that you might protect with a trade secret. So you see there's a difference between a trademark, a patent, a copyright, and a trade secret.
let's get back into our slides. Okay, I've just taken a whole detour. What doesn't a trademark do? Bear in mind, uh, just because you own a trademark, it really doesn't mean that you legally own a word or phrase. You can't snatch a term out the ether and just say, hey, I'm going to own this term and no one else could use it. That's not exactly how a trademark works. It doesn't mean you can stop folks from saying your particular term that you've come up with to protect your products or your services. And it doesn't mean that people are going to owe you money every time they say your term out loud. That's not what a trademark does. A trademark indicates the source of goods and services. Now, let's sort of zone in and think about some of the terms that we use to describe these trademarks. You might be familiar uh, with the term trademark, of course, but what about service mark? Now, traditionally, trademark used to only refer to uh, marks that are used to identify goods. And then service mark is, was a term and still is a term used to identify marks that identify services. But these days, folks use the term trademark to refer to both types of marks, marks that identify goods and marks that identify services. So it's up to you how you want to use these terms. Folks pretty much understand what you mean when you say them. Now let's talk about some of the more um, traditional trademarks, right? I, we saw a great a slide that showed like a number of black and white logos and designs and um, wording. But think about this. The common source identifiers we know for traditional marks are brand names, right? Those slogans and the logos. These are some examples of uh, different traditional marks all owned by the same company. So here, Coca-Cola owns the wording Coca-Cola to identify beverages. You can see the slogan, it's the real thing, also to identify beverages. And this logo, which is a combination of wording and design, smashed all together to create this other term. And that is likewise uh, a trademark, uh, a traditional one. And then next to it, you see an illustration of the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle. Well, if this was like a flat illustration, maybe it's a logo and it could be used to protect um, the, the, the same goods. But what if it's actually the shape of the bottle? Well, that moves us into the next topic, which is non-traditional types of marks, because you can actually protect uh, the shape of your product if um, you're using it as a source identifier. There are ways that you might be able to do that, provided you don't violate any other USPTO or trademark rules and regulations. I love talking about non-traditional marks. I feel like this is really fun. I consider myself a quote unquote creative, if you could be a creative lawyer, <laughs> okay? So when I think about these non-traditional marks, what am I talking about? Well, did you know that just about anything can be a trademark provided that it identifies specific goods and specific services in the marketplace? So a trademark could be a sound, it could be a color, it could be a scent, a motion, a hologram, a configuration shape. I'm going to, let's talk about, I'm just going to grab what I have right next to me. This one right here, you see this? This is Coca-Cola. This is the actual bottle itself. And guess what? The shape of this bottle is protected as a configuration mark. So here we have the shape, um, scent. If you think about um, Play-Doh, okay, Play-Doh right here. The, do you, if you close your eyes, can you remember what the smell of Play-Doh, what that smells like? I tell you, when I smell it, I'm transported back to kindergarten. I can be, I'm all of a sudden in Miss Dawkins' class, and I can remember how much fun I used to have. The point I'm trying to make is that, yes, you can absolutely trademark a scent um, if it's used to identify, for example, molding clay for use as a toy. You can identify it, uh, use it to identify specific goods. Now, what about the color? Color marks are pretty exciting. Here's one that you might recognize. That's bright orange owned by Hershey's to identify a specific type of candy. In this instance, Reese's peanut butter cups. You might think of Robin's egg blue to identify jewelry. When you see that color, you know that uh, this jewelry is from Tiffany's. You might think of um, insulation in, in your home, in those walls. I recently had a whole like water pipe problem, whatever. I had to get in there and all of a sudden I realized 
I have pink insulation, so I know that that insulation is coming from Owings Corning. That's their trademark, the color pink to identify insulation. Um, and the last one I'll talk about is our motion marks. Because motion marks can be something like the way the Lamborghini doors fly open, that butterfly motion. When you see that, you think of a Lamborghini vehicle. They have that trademark for that motion mark. But did you also know that an animated clip, a short video, can also be used uh, as, an anima as, as a motion mark? Think about the Pixar films, okay? You go into the movies, you're in your seat, the movie's about to start. Before the movie begins, there's going to be a little animated short film. You'll see the wordings Pixar pop up. You'll see this lamp jump up. Uh, it like moves its head up and then it shines this bright light into the screen, right? That little short film, that little short motion can be a trademark, a motion mark used to identify specific um, services. And in this, this instance, producing maybe animated films, okay? All right, now that we've had some fun, let's move forward into some of the more substantive um, areas of this of the slide deck. I wanna make sure you're hanging in here with me. So let's do a knowledge check. This is like a poll. You don't have to do anything, but think about this. You might, if you're home or at work, you might whisper at home, you might scream out loud. Here's the question. Does a federally registered trademark mean that you own a particular word or phrase? What do you think? I'll give you one, two, 30 seconds to think about it. The answer is no. It only means that you have the exclusive right to use that word or phrase to indicate the source of your goods and services. So no, you don't own it outright, but you own it with regard to having the exclusive right to use it to indicate where your goods and services come from. Here's another one. Do you have to use your business name as your trademark? What do you think? Well, the answer is no. You can, okay, but you don't have to. You could, instead of, instead of using your business name, right, that name that you use to um, create your business in your state, you know, you have to submit a name to the state. That's going to be your business name. That's where the IRS is going to send their bills, okay, to you. That's how you're going to file under that business name. Well, anyway, you could use that as a trademark, but many companies decide, no, 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 they want to select something more creative, um, think of Apple. The company name is Apple Incorporated, but they don't use incorporated on their products. They just use Apple. So they're not using their trade name or their business name. Instead, they've created a trademark a, a design. Sometimes it, it's that illustration of that bitten apple or the wording apple by itself. Let's talk about the benefits of federal registration. So the concept is, you know, why even register your mark with the office, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office? Why would you even do that? Let's talk about that. So we know that trademark rights um, are created in the United States in two main ways. They're created through common law and they're created through registering with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. That would be federal registration. Let's talk about the difference between the two. Now, federal registration of your mark, um, well, that means uh, that you're going to be registering your mark with us, okay? that That's not a requirement, but, it, but it's something that you can do. But what if you want to operate under common law? Well, common law rights are based on use, and they can be really quite powerful, um, but they're also limited to a certain extent. Interestingly enough, these common law rights are created as soon as you start using your mark in commerce. Think about that for a minute. You come up with a great trademark. Maybe you're selling a specific type of product and you begin to sell that product with that trademark attached. And that's how customers are able to find you in the marketplace. As soon as you begin to do that, we call that use in commerce, then pow, you're, you all of a sudden have trademark rights that are based on common law. But here's the thing, those common law rights are limited to the geographic area where they are used. So that means that if you're in Washington DC, like me, 
well, let me not use DC as an example because that's we've got some federal, um, different federal rules here. But let's say you're in um, New York, okay? Let's say you're in New York and you're using, um, you're selling a product in New York under common law. Well, you're protected in New York, but maybe you're not protected in Pennsylvania, okay? That's the difference between, one of the differences between common law and federal registration rights. What are the symbols that you can use if you're operating under common law? Well, you can use that TM superscript or the SM superscript that we talked about a moment ago, but you will never use that R in the, super, R in the circle, right? That's, that's really reserved for folks who register their uh, trademark with the office, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Okay, so what about those federal registration rights? Well, they're created again when you register your mark with us. Um, and what does it mean? Well, when you register your, your, your trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, well, there's a legal presumption, legal presumption that your mark is valid. There's a presumption that you now own the mark. OK, that's one of the, the, the rights that you that you have. There's a legal presumption also that you have the right to use your trademark in all 50 states and territories. OK, so that's quite wonderful, right? different from common law, because common law, again, limited to the geographic area where you're using the mark. Here, when you're talking about um, federal rights, you have the right to use that federal trademark in all 50 states and U.S. territories. The other thing about federal register registered marks um, is that you basically are putting other folks, the public, on notice just by virtue of having a federal reg registered trademark. You are putting folks on notice that you have rights in this trademark, that you're operating based on trademark rules and that you're saying this term, this color, this sound, this motion mark, et cetera, all of those examples, they are federally registered. And you're saying that these are the rights that I am, that I'm saying that I have. So that's, that's interesting. I'll tell you that that notice, it's real. And it's based on the fact of you navigating, once you navigate through our registration process, you get to a point where your mark is published and what's called the official gazette. Now it's gonna sit in that official gazette for 30 days. And during that time, anyone in the world who's watching that gazette, and believe me, lots of people are, they will have an opportunity to object to your trademark. And if no one objects and you and you meet the other requirements uh, for, for our office, those pr uh, procedural issues, substantive issues, and you're using your mark in commerce, if you have all of that done, then your mark moves to registration. So you can absolutely say that if you had a fed federally registered trademark, you took the time to put people on notice that this is what you're doing and that you want to have those federal rights. But what are some of the benefits, okay? If you have a federally registered trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, you can bring an action in federal court instead of state court. OK, so more powerful. You can uh, register your uh, registered. You can register your federally registered trademark with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Office. And that's a great way to stop the importation of counterfeit goods. Let's say you're in the business of, of creating, producing, selling uh, goods that are constantly being knocked off. I'm talking about electronics, sneakers, handbags, pharmaceuticals, airplane parts. I mean, what's not being knocked off now, right? Well, if you're in that situation, you can take your registered mark, uh, contact the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, put it, fill out an application, have it listed with them, and they'll be on the lookout for any goods coming into the United States, and they will be seizing those goods if those goods are, are counterfeit, okay? So that's a great benefit. And another benefit is that you can use your federal trademark application or your registration as a launch point to obtain rights in other countries. Now, let me slow down. What am I talking about? Well, under our U.S. trademark rules, when you obtain trademark rights, and this is really every country, every country has their own trademark rules and regulations. We say that um, trademark rights are territorial in that way. So that means that if you obtain federal rights in the United States, well, that doesn't mean you have protection in China or Mexico or uh, in France, okay? Indeed, you would typically have to go to each one of those countries to register your mark there. But uh, the United States uh, patent, uh, sorry, the United States has has entered into a treaty. It's called this Madrid Protocol Treaty. And under this treaty, um, 
there's this idea where you can do file a, an application with the United States. And at the same time, you can put in a, a request for an international uh, registration with any of the countries who have signed on to this treaty. And right now we're up to about 130 countries. So it's like a one-stop shop. Of course, there's more paperwork. And of course, there's a little bit more money. But isn't that great that you can actually get all this done going to one place? The people who or the, the agency that's going to review that international application is the World Intellectual Property Office. Now, when that mark, your mark registers, you get to use that R in the circle. Um, and so that's really great. You're not going to use that TM or SM anymore. You've got, to, you've got the option to use the R in the circle. Let's make sure you're still hanging in here with me. Here's another question. Are you required to register your trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office? What do you think? Is that a requirement? Mm. <laughs> no, federal registration is a choice. Now, many trademark owners are, will apply uh, for federal registration uh, because of these nationwide protection, but it's up to you. So the business owners have a lot to decide as they are navigating through our registration process. And one more question, does registering your trademark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office give you international protection? What do you think? No, registering your trademark with us only provides you rights in the United States and, and its territories. If you want that international protection, you can actually absolutely um, initiate the process. You can um, submit your application and fill out that additional uh, documentation and leverage the Madrid protocol like we talked about. You're going to pay a different additional fee. And so you might be able to obtain protection in other countries, but there are some additional steps there. Okay. <laughs> We're almost done. We're about midway through. So let's talk about um, how to select a strong trademark, okay? You want to make sure that you're selecting a mark that will um, not be refused and that will sail kind of through our application process. You also want to be able to enforce it, okay, against others. So how do you do that? A couple of things I want to think, want you to think about as we're moving through the rest of the slides here. Remember that our goal is to register marks. Now, I know a lot of folks think that our goal is to refuse marks, but I, I tell you, it's not true. It's really not. Our goal is to register marks. That's what we want to do. Our examining attorneys get additional incentives to register marks. But your goal is to select a mark that is federally registrable. That means it can go through our application process and not be rejected but you also want to make sure that your mark is legally protectable or that it's enforceable because every mark is not registrable, right? There are rules and regulations that guide that process and every mark is not enforceable. Now, let me try to give you a little bit of a story to help you better understand this concept. Now, in uh, 2023, there was a major company that celebrated 200 years. It was Levi's, okay? Um, I'm going to kind of use them as an example, but I want you to know that my story is fictional. There's no part of this. This is that is the, the, the I'm not referring to Levi's is what I'm trying to say. This is a fictional company. Um, they also sell jeans. All right. Let's say that this particular company I'm talking about in my story, uh, they're selling jeans under the brand Butterfly. OK, let's say that um, they've been in business of selling jeans under this butterfly band, brand since 1853. So 200 years, right? Um, and in 2024, it'd be 201, all right? So if they've been operating that long, um, let's say in this instance that they never registered their trademark with the US Patent and Trademark Office, okay? They've been operating under common law all this time. Now, if that's the case, um, think about what would happen if in 2024, a competitor jumps up and says, hey, uh, I think I want to uh, register a trademark uh, because I can see that this butterfly company that's been around for 200 years never registered their trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So I think I want to slide in here and see if I can get that same brand name identifying the same product. I wonder if I could do it. <laughs> Believe it or not, this happens every day. <laughs> so what is going to happen in this instance? Well, if this competitor file, files an application with the office, okay, 
and it's selected, uh, it's randomly pulled by an examining attorney. They get the file, they review it. The first thing they're going to do is conduct their own search. But their, their search only searches the USPTO database. And the USPTO database only contains marks that have been applied for and marks that have registered. So in this instance, that original butterfly company that's been selling jeans for 200 years under common law would not be in the USPTO database, okay? So when the examining attorney conducts their search, they won't find them. And so if that competitor doesn't have any other issues, it's possible that that competitor's trademark could be approved for registration. But the real question is, will the competitor be able to enforce their rights against this butterfly company that's been continuously using their mark for 200 years? And the answer is no, uh, because in uh, the United States, trademark rights are based on first to use a mark in commerce. And in this instance, the competitor would have been first to use. So it's important that you select a mark that's registrable, that can go through our review process and not be rejected but can also withstand um, a common law uh, objection. You wanna make sure that your trademark can be enforced against those type of issues as well. The other thing you wanna bear in mind is that our filing fees are not refundable. Okay, so you gotta be very deliberate about the type of marks that you select and conducting your search beforehand to make sure that you're not running into any of these common law marks like the butterfly marks and any of these um, competitors, okay, who might've filed. All right, so what are the two common reasons why a trademark could be refused, okay? We are talking about uh, the two most common reasons will be the likelihood of confusion refusal and the descriptiveness refusal. Okay, we're gonna talk about these in more detail in just a moment. But as we move into this and you're gearing up with your questions, because I know you're gonna have questions for me at the end of this presentation, just remember, we can't provide advice or answer questions about um, your specific matter, but we can maybe sort of talk about some of the rules um, that guide decisions. Okay. When you file your trademark application with our office, you want to avoid this likelihood of confusion and descriptiveness. It's called a merely descriptive refusal. All right. So let's talk about selecting a trademark and avoiding this likelihood of confusion refusal. So the USPTO really like we're talking about the policy behind this um, likelihood of confusion. The USPTO wants to make sure that consumers are not confused about the source of the goods and services. They wanna make sure that when you go into McDonald's that you know you're in McDonald's and not McDowell's. I don't know if you remember that movie with Eddie Murphy back in the day, but the point is consumers, they, consumers are king at the USPTO and we wanna make sure that not, they're not confused about what they're buying because someone is manipulating the trademark. So how do you decide whether there's some sort of confusing, confusingly similar mark? Let's say that you have your mark here and you conduct your search to see if there's any other mark out there that's confusingly, confusingly similar that may uh, present a challenge to you. Well, there's a test that you're going to do and the test is a two-part one. First, you're gonna ask yourself if you're comparing your mark to a registered mark. You're gonna say, are the marks similar? Are they similar in sound, appearance, or meaning? And then you're gonna ask yourself, are the goods that are offered under the mark, are they related in any way? That's a big concept. I'm sure that you are going to better understand it as we walk through a few examples. Let's look at the first one. Let's say that your trademark, yours is T.Marquee, and you are offering selling shirts in the marketplace. Let's say that you've conducted your own search and you didn't find anything. But when you filed your application, the examining attorney conducted a search and she found this other company, T. Markey, that's selling pants. So you're, you're, you're trying to decide, hey, was that examining attorney right? You know, or what will the examining attorney do? Well, let's decide. Looking at the marks, uh, we're saying, are they similar in sound, appearance, or meaning? In this instance, well, they're identical, so check. Then we're looking at the goods, shirts and pants. Are they related? Well, let's think about it. How many different brands can you think of that sell shirts and pants under the same brand name or the same uh, logo? If you can think of a lot of them, 
then it's a very high chance, right, that these goods are related and that there's going to be a refusal because the marks are similar and the goods are related. Okay. Look at another one. T. Marky, this is your mark. <clears throat> You're selling shirts. And the registered mark uh, that you find when you conduct your search is T. Markey. You're trying to decide, will that examining attorney uh, issue a refusal based on these two? Would, would they say that this mark that I found, T. Markey, is going to be a problem for me? Is it going to be confusingly similar? Let's go through the test together. We're looking at the marks. Are they similar in sound, appearance, or meaning? In this instance, they're not similar in appearance, right? But they are similar in sound. Okay, so we got one of the three, so that's fine. That's enough to say that they're similar. Then we're going to look at the goods and we're asking, are they related? Well, these are the same goods that we talked about in our last example. So we know, yes, there are lots of brands we can think of that sell shirts and pants under the same brand name. So here, again, a refusal because the marks are similar and that they sound the same and the, the goods are related uh, because consumers are used to seeing one company make pants and shirts. Do another. What about if your mark is T. T. Marky? You're selling shirts, right? And uh, the registered mark is T. Marky, but uh oh, goods are different. We've got golf flags. We know that the marks here are similar in sound, but the question is are the goods related? Are shirts related to golf flags? Well, in this instance, it's a question. I'm not a golf aficionado. I can't even tell you the last time I've been to a golf range or, or a golf store. So I'd have to conduct some research to determine, well, how, you know, are there a lot of uh, companies out there that sell shirts and golf flags under the same brand name? I don't know. Um, but let's say that I don't find many. Okay. Maybe I only find one or two. Then maybe there's no refusal here. In this instance, you might argue, yes, that the marks uh, sound the same, but maybe you'll argue that consumers are not used to seeing one company sell shirts and golf flags because you don't have any evidence to support that. So just like the examining attorney, you want to make sure you do your due diligence. You want to make sure you conduct your research, do a good clearance search of your mark so that you can anticipate what the examining attorney might say. Again, we don't issue refunds. So that means if you file your application and you get a refusal that you cannot overcome, you don't get your money back, okay? So you wanna be sure that you're careful about what type of marks you apply for. All right, so how do you determine which marks may be confusingly similar to your mark? That clearance search we just talked about, you wanna search our database. Now the USPTO search system is free and it's available 24 seven unless there's some kind of maintenance thing going on, right? Um, but again, you want to be sure that you find um, not only the marks that are in our database, but you got to make sure you find those common law marks, like those butterfly marks that folks who have never submitted an application uh, through our system, never registered a mark, you want to make sure you find them too. So you search our database, okay, that has all the federally applied for and registered marks. And then you're gonna search the internet to try to catch up with those common law marks so you don't miss any of those either. So who can do this search for you? Well, you can certainly do it you, do it yourself. Um, if you go to our website right now and put on, click in there uh, in that search bar, you're gonna type in their trademark search. You will find lots of videos that help you better understand how to new to to work uh, <laughs> our new trademark search system. It's brand new uh, as of this year. And so uh, many people are trying to uh, better understand and learn how to do it. So you're not alone. This is a great time to be at ground zero. Um, but you could also think about hiring someone to help you. You might decide to hire an attorney to uh, conduct the search for you. Now, what kind of search would an attorney do? Well, they're going to, of course, look at our database, looking at our registrations and applications. They'll look at the state trademark databases uh, because they are going to find there some of those trade names or business names because some of those business names are also used as a trademark. So you want to search there. Um, you're going to look at the foreign trademark databases. That's important, too, to see what's out there in the world, because some of those companies might also be thinking about using their mark in this country uh, and the Internet. Don't forget about that. OK, that's a full clearance search. The great thing about hiring a lawyer to do your search is that lawyers have to report to the Bar Association, right? They have 
they had specific ethical obligations. And so you know that if you're working with a trademark lawyer, you can always, um, you know, challenge them and their work and make sure, you know, that they're doing the best for you. When you hire some of these third party companies to do these searches for you, be careful because many times they will conduct a great search. They'll put your term in, in a search engine. They'll give you about a thousand results and they'll send them all to you. And you'll have to be the one to navigate through. So make sure as you're hiring your companies to conduct your searches, be sure that the terms of your agreement with them are that not only do they conduct a search, but they have to review the search results with you. They have to write a memorandum explaining which one is the most problematic and why. Those are some of the um, the things that you might want to look out for as you're thinking about hiring someone else. And if you are looking for some free help, you might consider contacting one of our PTRCs. In the slide deck, you will find some links to the PTRCs, libraries all over the country where folks are trained on how to conduct searches. They can't exactly do it for you, but they can teach you how. You could also go to our, our law school clinics. I think there's, a, there's four or five in the New York area. Um, those schools have attorneys, um, one supervising attorney in charge of a class of student attorneys, and those student attorneys will handle um, individual cases. The only fee you have to pay is your filing fee. You can find those clinics on our website, uspto.gov, and drop in that search engine, Law School Clinics. Let's do one more. Here we have X Seed as your mark, and you're selling agricultural seeds, and the registered mark that you find is X Seed for live plants. You're asking yourself, is there a, a refusal in my future? Okay, what does the crystal ball say? In this instance, um, looking at the marks, are they similar in sound, appearance, or meaning. I would say here, they sound the same. Looking at the goods, are they related? Can I think of a, of a company that's selling seeds and live plants under the same branding, same brand name, same brand logo? Absolutely. So here, yes, there's a refusal. What's the other, one of the other main reasons why your mark is refused? We talked about likelihood of confusion. Let's talk about descriptiveness. You want to avoid selecting a trademark that describes um, features of the goods and services that you offer, because we know that those descriptive marks don't indicate the source of the goods and services. When, um, when uh, consumers uh, encounter them, they don't think of that term as a trademark. And so it's not, they're not able to see a descriptive term um, as being helpful in that way. And let me give you some examples. Think about if you're selling candles and you want to call them apple pie, but they smell like apple pie. You see how difficult it is for a, a customer to know what is the brand? What is where who has made this candle that smells like apple pie? Because the term apple pie doesn't provide any type of trademark source identification. Okay, that's the challenge with using descriptive marks. So the test is, does the trademark merely describe the goods and services? Does it describe an ingredient of your product? Does it describe the quality of your services or your product, a characteristic of your users? Does it describe the user? Does it describe the function of the product or the function of the services, um, the purpose? Any of those things might be considered descriptive. And so you want to pause as you're selecting your terms, um, as you're selecting your trademark to figure out, is it going to be a good one that can avoid this refusal. Let's look at this infographic here because maybe you're a visual learner. What we want to do is stay in the red zone, the hot zone. We want to select marks that are fanciful, arbitrary, suggestive, stay away from des descriptive marks, stay away from generic wording, which are not marks at all. Let's walk through each one. What's a generic term? These are common everyday terms uh, to describe goods uh, and services. They're not registrable. I love to use the example of the word milk. Now, if you think about milk um, being a term to describe a dairy-based beverage, if you are in the if you make oat milk or almond milk or even um, um, traditional regular milk from a cow or something, right, or from a goat, you're going to want to use the term milk to describe it, and so were all your competitors. And that's why that term is generic. That is the common everyday name for the product. Okay. So you want to stay away from that because you're going to get a refusal that is generic. Um, but think about this. Milk is not always generic for goods and services. I don't know if you know that, that, that there's a brand of makeup 
<laughs> it's called Milk, and I actually do use it. They have a terrific spray <laughs> for setting your makeup, okay? Milk, though, um, when it's used to identify makeup, is not descriptive. It doesn't describe features of, of, the, of the product. It doesn't describe the ingredients or the users or anything. So it's a great term for makeup, not such a great term for dairy-based or non-dairy-based beverage, okay? Descriptive trademarks. Um, so we're moving up the infographic. We're, we're moving up into the red zone. Descriptive terms really are those that you kind of want to stay away from. They're difficult to register, difficult to protect, although it's not impossible. They directly describe something about your product or your services. Remember the user, they describe something about the user, a feature, a purpose, um, a function, et cetera. They're unregisterable unless they acquire distinctiveness. You might think about in your mind, come up with lots of descriptive terms and you say, no, wait a minute, these terms are, are registered. So how did they get through uh, that refusal if they were descriptive? Well, sometimes descriptive terms can acquire distinctiveness. Uh, <clears throat> if you are the owner and you've selected a term that's descriptive and you can um, prove to the office, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, that your mark has now all of a sudden um, it's now being viewed by your cons by your consumers as a trademark. Well, you might be able to convince them. Maybe you can show that you've been using it over five years. Maybe you can provide some additional evidence, survey information from your customer base that says, hey, when we see this term, we, we know this is so-and-so. We know this is coming from this company. We know it's a trademark. We don't think it's descriptive. You'd have, there's, you'd have to establish that and prove that with the office. One great example of this would be the term creamy whip for whip topping. This term is descriptive, okay? All topping is creamy. All, all whipped topping is creamy. All whipped topping is whipped. Um, in this instance, this descriptive term is actually registered because they acquired distinctiveness. They were able to convince the office that over time, this descriptive term uh, was able to turn into <laughs> a trademark, okay? As a source identifier. What about suggestive marks? I love these because again, they're creative and I love to be able to use a bit of imagination. These are terms that suggest the quality of your goods and services. So for example, um, if you think of copper tone, right, for suntan lotion, this is a term, uh, it's registered. Uh, it requires a little imagination to better understand the products offered. Uh, you're not exactly gonna turn copper toned but there's a bit of a couple of steps it takes to get back to the product. Fanciful terms are invented terms. Uh, they have no meaning in any language. They're completely made up and they are registrable. Uh, you can think of uh, Xerox, uh, Kodak, Kleenex, Pepsi, all made up terms. So you can absolutely make up a term and uh, create something new and then uh, and, and spend time marketing that term and using it as a trademark. Great. Or you can select an arbitrary term. An arbitrary trademark would be an actual mark. It's an actual word, I'm sorry, but it has no association with the goods and services that are offered underneath it. So I know I've used Apple for like every example today, but it's a great trademark, okay? These terms are registrable. Apple is great because you can think of the fruit, but think of all the great work that this Apple Incorporated company did to market Apple uh, because no one would associate Apple with computers, right? It's very, I mean, they're, it's sort of different. Maybe you might think of Isaac Newton and Apple falling from a tree and sometime in some way get to computer technology. There's so many steps there that this is arbitrary, okay? It's so far from the product that it's arbitrary. Another good example is gap for clothing. Okay. That's a pretty good term. It's a term it's in the dictionary, but it's not commonly associated with, with apparel. And what about blackberry? Again, it's a fruit, um, not commonly associated with technological services or, or mobile devices. Knowledge check. Okay, here we go. Is this registrable? Bicycle, your term is bicycle as your trademark and you sell bicycles. Is that acceptable? What do you think? Or what about bicycle, the term used bicycle for playing cards? Which one of these is registrable? If you're saying bicycle for playing cards, you're right. Because bicycle for bicycles, bicycle as a brand name for bicycles, not so good. It's generic and you're going to get a refusal. It's not even a trademark at all. It's a generic term. Uh, notice that you, you can only determine um, whether something is descriptive 
or whether something is generic based on the goods and services offered because it, it sort of changes based on what kind of product or service it's being used to describe. Okay, we're gonna walk through or sprint through, I'm looking at the clock, the filing and registration process. So there's four different registration steps. Um, I like to think of it as five though, because I want you to be sure to conduct your search before you file. So you conduct your search, you file your application, your application is examined by an examining attorney. They're looking for procedural issues or requirements that need to be met and substantive issues like the 2D likelihood of confusion refusal or a 2E1 um, merely descriptive refusal. Um, if your mark uh, is able to navigate through the, the examination process, you're either able to fix an issue that was raised or no issues are raised at all. You go to the publication phase and you sit in that official gazette for 30 days. No one objects. Now you're at a fork in the road, okay? And this can go one of two ways, <laughs> all right? If you based your application on use, meaning that when you filed your application, you were actually using your mark to identify real goods that are sold, being sold right then, or to identify real services that are being rendered right then, then that use-based application is gonna go on its own track. A use-based application at the time of publication if there's no objections, it's going straight to registration, no additional money, that's it. But if you filed based on intent to use, meaning you are not using your mark at the time that you filed, in fact, you just came up with the term and you just knew uh, you identified the goods and services you were gonna offer, but you weren't actually offering them, well, that intent to use application has a whole different pathway. And what happens next is, once you, uh, your mark sits on that official gazette for 30 days, there are no objections, you're going to get what's called a notice of allowance. It's going to be a document that's going to mean that you're going to have to file something else. Then you'll have to establish use, provide some evidence of use, pay some additional money. And if there's no problems with that, then you go to registration. You're going to file in our system electronically. Back in the day when I was first working in the office, it was a paper file. And we used to pull these big, dusty files, giant files from a file room, okay? Now we're filing online like everybody else. And our electronics filing is mandatory, except in very rare circumstances. There are two different options here, T's Plus and T's Standard. T's being the name of our online application form. That's the system, I'm sorry, that we're using. Pretty much the filing fee is $350, okay? But you get a discount if you provide us with more information up front and if you use pre-selected wording to describe your goods and services. We have what's called an ID manual. And in this ID manual, it's an online database. You put in your terms to identify your goods. Let's say you're selling lipstick. You put in lipstick. It's going to tell you what class it's in and it's going to tell you um, give you some different examples of wording that's acceptable to describe lipstick. You might want to describe it as lipstick, or you might want to say cosmetics, with a little, which is a little broader. All right. That'll be your choice. And uh, if you use that uh, ID manual uh, to select your identification of goods, you get a discount. Uh, plus, you're going to be required to provide some additional statements that like a translation or a description of your mark if you have a logo or maybe if your mark is in color, you'll have to say it's in color, lots of things. Otherwise, if you file for the $350 option, well, you get to just put in your description free form for your goods and services, and the, the examining attorney will have to review it and sort of wrestle with that language. For that privilege, you pay $100 more. Let's talk quickly about how you come up with our fees. See that it says here on this slide that the fees are... Um, they're based on this international class. Fees are determined by how many classes you include in your application. Let's go back to our great example, the butterfly company. Let's say you're the butterfly company and you're selling jeans. Well, jeans are in class 25. Okay, there's one class. But we know one thing about companies that sell apparel. They like to sell everything else. So maybe they're selling jeans under the butterfly brand. But what if they're selling cosmetics? That's in class three. Now we have two classes. What if they're selling sunglasses? That's in class nine. Now we have three classes. What about if they're selling mugs in class four? Class, 
I'm um, class 21, sorry, that's the fourth class. Or um, what if they have, they want to get their trademark uh, for use in identifying a retail store, a retail clothing store. We call that retail store services featuring uh, clothing. Class 35, uh, that's five classes. And maybe they want to do jewelry in class 14, six classes. The T's plus, $250 times six, that's $1,500, okay? Or that T standard, $350 times six, to $2,100. That's how you do the fees. Now, what are the requirements? When you file your application, you really only need five things. You need a drawing. That's really your depiction of the mark. Is it going to be um, wording or a logo, a design? Is it going to be a color or a motion mark? Is it going to be sent? Whatever. You want to be able to give us a clear depiction. You want to give us a listing of the goods and services that you're using. Remember that ID manual. List out all the goods and all the services that you're using your mark to identify. And the filing basis. You got to tell us, are you using the mark now? Or are you intending to do so in the future? And your contact information. All of our correspondents, we're contacting you via the email in your application. So be sure it's one that works and it's one that you check. And then you want to provide that filing fee, okay? Well, remember the common basis for refusal, likelihood of confusion, merely descriptive, we talked about today. What about geographically descriptive? That's one. Uh, what about if you're in New York and you want to call and you're selling books and you want to call yourself the New York uh, Book Company? Well, that's going to be a problem because you can't use a geographically descriptive term like New York uh, to, to, as a trademark because everybody in New York should be able to reference their services and goods by saying New York. So there's some additional steps you'll have to go through in order to do something like that. Another common refusal is your specimen. Let's say you're coming in for software. You describe your software as downloadable software. But guess what? Your software really is web-based. There's no download button anywhere. So you want to make sure that whatever way you describe your products and services in your application matches what you're doing in the real world and matches the uh, screenshot of that website that you're providing. They need to match, okay? Otherwise, you might get a specimen refusal. And ornamental. I know we're kind of running out of time. We only got a few more minutes, but ornamental refusals are really quite interesting. Many folks uh, might come in for like a mug. Okay, I don't know if you can read what this says. This says Fashion Law Institute. This is out of Fordham, New York. Okay, good friend of mine there, Susan Scafidi, running that program. Anyway, this mark on this mug, if you try to submit a photo of this mug in your application as your specimen, you're trying to show that you use the mark on a mug and that's what you provide, you're going to get an ornamental refusal because where do customers look to find who made a mug? They look to the bottom, they look to a hang tag hanging off this, they look to the box it's sold in. They don't look here because this is where de decorative features go. Same thing for t-shirts. That's where decorative information goes. You want a hang tag on a t-shirt to avoid a ornamental refusal. All right, your responsibilities when you obtain your trademark is you've got to enforce your rights, okay? We are not, unfortunately, <laughs> an enforcement agency. You're in charge of taking that registration certificate and using it to support a cease and desist letter or your infringement uh, suit. You are also, though, required to file your post-registration documents. A trademark will last forever unless uh, 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 it's, it's very different from patent rights, which expire, and copyright rights, which expire. Trademark rights last forever if you renew them, okay? So it's up to you to file these documents and you must file them between the fifth and sixth year. So your mark registers on this day, five years into the future, between that fifth and sixth year, you file some renewal documents. Then again, 10 years into the future, your mark registers here, 10 years into the future, between the ninth and 10th year, you're gonna file some additional documents and some additional money. And then every 10 years thereafter, that's how you keep your trademark registration alive. If you want more information about this, I want you to check out the slide deck. You're gonna see a link there. You can join us for our Trademark Basics Bootcamp. This is an eight module um, quarterly program that we run where you can hear um, me or someone from our trademark customer outreach team talking about trademarks from soup to nuts. That means from searching all the way to registration and beyond. And so you can get more information. They're on Tuesdays from 2 until 3.30. You can put trademark basics 
boot camp in the search engine for USPTO.gov to find our new dates for this quarter. Okay, are you guaranteed registration of your trademark? We're at 12 o'clock. Lord, and I just saw Jenny pop in there. I think she's trying to tell me something. <laughs> okay, she's trying to say we're just about done. I was Are just you... checking <laughs> if you were wrapped up at that point or not. But we're just about continue. to wrap, wrap up. We got a you few are more. Great. <laughs> I'm watching you though. I see you in the corner of my eye. Okay. You are great. All right, so here's a knowledge check for us. Are you guaranteed registration of your trademark? I know these days you might be getting emails from all these different companies saying, I can guarantee registration. Let me tell you the short answer to this is no. <laughs> Every application is reviewed on its own merit before it registers. And so it really, um, rules change, you know? Um, and so every time you apply, you're gonna be um, being reviewed by an examining attorney that's looking at the rules, um, all of the rules and regulations, looking for pro procedural deficiencies or substantive issues that you may have an opportunity to overcome or argue against, but, uh, there is no guarantee here. Um, that that filing fee that you pay that you pay is for that examination process for that time. Okay, and that is why there are no refunds. If your trademark registers, do you have to do anything to keep your registration alive? Well, what do you think? Yes, <laughs> of course, you have to continue to use your mark in commerce. And you have to continue to file those required post-registration documents that you will do so in that fifth and sixth year after your mark registers, in that ninth and tenth year after your mark registers, and every 10 year afterwards. Okay, I only want to show you one thing about where to go for help. I'm going to slide my, I'm going to slide this right on over here. And I want um, to show you... Uh, some free resources, okay? So if I go, I'm on the USPTO.gov page and I'm going to more tools and I wanna to go to free resources in your state. I wanna pull up New York right here. And I just want you to see this and then we're gonna go to questions. We've got, of course, the patent pro bono program, but these are those law school clinics I talked about. We've got Syracuse University, Fordham Laws, um, they have a clinic. Brooklyn Law School has a clinic and New York Law School has a clinic where you can get some support for free. Um, it, PTRC Libraries, New York State Library, Buffalo and Erie County Public Library, Science, Industry and Business Library, Central Library, Rochester, Smithtown Main Library, where you can go and get assistance searching. Okay, Jenny, I'm not going to go through the rest of these resources because they're all in the slide deck with links. I'll just say that if you want to speak to a person, you absolutely can do so. I'll pull up that as uh, Jenny gets ready to get toss me some questions if we have the time. Yes, we do have a few questions for you. Okay, perfect. I'll just keep this up on the page. Um, perfect. Trademark Assistance Center if you want to call for help. Okay. Wonderful. So much great information. Thank so you. So much. Too much, baby. <laughs> but hopefully it's just enough to spark your curiosity. That's why we share the slide deck and the recording so people can go back and go back over what they need to individually learn. So okay. um, a few questions. Is it true that you cannot apply for a trademark unless there is interstate commerce? You must have use in commerce. It's a great question. And use in commerce is one of those things that is um, fact-based. So the way you describe use in commerce, it could be interstate between states. It could be um, between the United States and the U.S. territory, uh, right? Uh, it could be between the United States and a foreign country. So that would be how you would establish use in commerce in those ways. Use in commerce uh, differs between whether you're having goods, use in commerce is one thing, and services use in commerce is another. I'll give you a quick example. If you're selling goods um, and your trademark is affixed to those goods, uh, you can establish use in commerce by that transport of those goods over the state lines from state to state, from uh, the state to another country, and between uh, the state and the territory. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned an intent to use application. Could you uh, just briefly go over the like a pros and cons of that type of application? Yeah, it's a good question too. Um, 
so these days, uh, because uh, there's so much um, copycat, uh, there's so many people who are looking for new ideas all the time. If you feel that you want to start talking about this great tra trademark or this great brand concept that you have, you might consider filing based on intent to use because what you're doing is you're getting in line uh, in the queue for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to obtain those federal rights. And I will tell you, unfortunately, we are backlogged. We are about eight and a half months behind. So if you file today, it won't be eight for eight months until it's actually reviewed. During that time, a lot can happen. So it's a good idea to get started with the process. If you can, you can go ahead and pay your fee and get in line um, as soon as you can. I can't think of any downside to that um, because I feel like what you're doing is putting folks on notice that this is how you're operating. And remember, you can still um, begin to use your mark in common law if you'd like, but this is that federal registration process. Thank you. A follow-up question on the commerce uh, question that we had just a moment ago. So if a person's commerce is only in New York State, uh, how does that work for use in commerce? Will that show up as uh, sufficient? Right. So remember, based on the examples that I was giving, if you're only operating within a state, there is no use in commerce unless you're in D D.C. because D.C. is a, is an exception to that rule, being that we are have federal you know jurisdictions here. But it, in that instance, but one way you might consider and remember, wink, I am not giving you legal advice. We are talking in general about the rules and regulations. OK, so what I'm saying is some I've seen some folks try to rely on interstate. Uh, I'm sorry, Internet. So if they can establish that they're selling uh, goods on the Internet, of course, you're, you're cr crossing all kinds of boundaries and, 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 and um, borders in that manner. But it's up to you to be able to maintain some evidence of that in case you're ever challenged, because there are no trademark rights without use in commerce. Thank you. Um, we have someone on the webinar today who creates brands, logos, names, slogans for clients and is wondering if you have resources to check out as far as the responsibility role, timing of a designer. Uh, when it comes to getting clients set up legally with a trademark? So I think I, I'm, I'm sort of, I, let me try to better understand. So so this is a, a person who's not an attorney, but who is um, assisting folks in maybe creating the graphics associated with, with, the, with the branding. Is that right? right? And okay. yeah, so like what point during the branding process, you know, would somebody kind of want to look at, getting a trademark for some of these items like the the logo or the the name those kind of things right okay so I would think that in this day and time because everything is so digital and and, and information is flying all around right at warp speed if you have come up with this concept and it is important to you all right um you want to try to get your uh branding filed as soon as you can. But remember, the challenge is, is that you can't just snag terms and images out of the air. They have to be associated with goods and services that are offered for sale or rendered in the marketplace. Okay. So as soon as you do that, then you want to, as soon as you have an idea of what the product services are, you want to go ahead and file. Um, but remember, your money is tied to the number of classes that are identified. And so maybe you don't do 20. Maybe you just do the first one or two that are the most important to you and file that now. I'll just caution that if you're not an attorney, you cannot um, ad file an application uh, for someone else. Uh, meaning what I'm saying, only attorneys can file applications for folks. If you're like a paralegal or a branding consultant, you cannot file a trademark application for someone else. But if you're a lay person, you can certainly file one for yourself. Okay. Right. Yes, this person is a brand designer and um, wants to be able to give recommendations on when. when okay, yes. Yeah, so probably. Yeah, process. probably. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, because yes. they're helping to create. Because remember, as you're thinking about selecting your trademark, you've got to go through this checklist that we went through. We only went through two, likelihood of confusion. So as you're designing, you're searching, is this even viable? Because there's no sense in creating something that is not going to be protectable. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we had someone raise a hand. So um, please drop your question into the Q&A box, if you would. Um, that is how we are taking questions today. Or you could use the chat as well if you... Uh, are having any difficulties finding the Q&A box. 
uh, while this person does that, um, I do want to, first of all, say thank you for this amazing presentation today. Uh, we've had a comment about how informative and engaging you've made this material. <laughs> so bravo, you are a fantastic presenter and we appreciate your, your efforts here today so much. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who has come and asked questions uh, and, and learned along with us at the NYSBDC today. Please remember that you will receive that follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, I, I'll be able to get it out tomorrow uh, with a link to the recording and a PDF of the slides. So you can go back and review all of these things that uh, <laughs> that have been gone over today. And uh, I, I know it was a flood of information, so we're going to help you out and make sure you have everything to go back and review. Um, and then, so there in the slides, uh, there is there are a ton of links, uh, places to go, ways to contact people for information and assistance. So make sure to look through those slides uh, for those specific questions that you have. And if uh, you have any questions related to the NYSBDC, you are more than welcome to reply to that follow-up email that you will get. And uh, we will we will be glad to help you out. Um, let's see. So, okay, somebody, um, this is a person who needs help doing a trademark, um, I, I think was our, our other question here. And so just uh, if you are looking for someone to help you with a trademark, where would you recommend starting, Marisa? Right. I would recommend going to the Bar Association in your state um, because they have a listing of trademark attorneys. So if you're looking for, and I recommend always an attorney because you have leverage against attorneys, you know, <laughs> okay. So attorneys are great. So maybe consider going there or going to that law school if you're not in a race, because, you know, law school clinics sometimes can take a little bit more time because it's a learning process. So you want to maybe go to that law school clinic page and click on the New York state and see. Um, you also know that for clinics, we there you know, 50 states, a lot of clinics are not limited to their jurisdiction, their geographic location, and they'll take cases from any and everybody. So you might consider also checking out different states to see who has maybe a low number of applicants to see if you can get into the queue sooner. Okay. And I know you demonstrated how to get to those resources a few minutes ago. And so uh, make sure to look in the recording for that when you get it so that you can get that exact process of where on the website to find that information. All right. That wraps up our questions. More thanks coming in. And uh, with that, we will close this webinar down for the day, but we wish you all a wonderful rest of your day and look for those uh, resources that will be coming to you to your inbox soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Jenny and Liam.